or the directed, it kind of depends on what's going on that day. Um, but welcome to the Lou Wallace, General Lou Wallace Study Museum. If you have phones, I just remember to turn mine down, so I won't ring during his talk, during Dr. Miller's talk, and hopefully nobody else will. Um, this is eighth or ninth program we've done this year in our um, Festival of Words, recognizing the significance of the um, golden age of Hoosier literature, Indiana literature, that started with Ben-Hur and ran for 45 years or so into the 1920s, early 30s. Um, a very important era in Indiana's history, and we're doing this exhibit in part to recognize the Indiana Bicentennial this year. Um, we have two more programs following this, one at the end of October on the 29th will be Sherry Wagner, who is the Poet Laureate for Indiana, and I don't think she's been in Crawfordsville before, so we're looking forward to having Sherry. And then in November on Small Business Saturday, we'll have a group of authors from around the region, not just Montgomery County, um, talking about publication, self-publishing, um, where the industry is heading, and work, you know, just visiting informally with people. So that will be the last program in the series. Um, tonight we have Dr. Howard Miller, and despite what he says, he is the smartest man on Ben-Hur on the face of the earth. Um, wow. Yeah, I know that's a big statement, isn't it? Um, Professor Miller is retired from the University of Texas, Austin. He's a professor, was a professor, um, taught the history of religion um, in America, um, both in departments of history and the Department of Religious Studies at Austin. He retired after 40 years, which meant he started teaching at the age of 10. <laughs> <laughs> he got enamored, he's been enamored with Ben-Hur for what, 15 or 16 or 17 years? And it started in an unusual way. He's a native of Texas and um, was driving long distances and got Ben Hur as a book on tape, which we actually have in the gift shop for sale. No hints there. Um, but in listening to it as an audio book, he really got very fascinated with um, the story and has done tremendous research and has really raised Ben Hur and Lou Wallace's um, recognition, not only in this country, but really around the world. Um, it's an interesting phenomenon that's going on right now with um, that topic. So, without any further ado, I will turn it over to Dr. Howard Miller. Do you have any secret vices or addictions? <laughs> <laughs> <That'll do it. laughs> Filthy habit. Thank you, Larry. Thank you all for being here. This is really fun. I look forward to it. And uh, this place has been very important to me for about 15 years, and I know some wonderful, wonderful people here. And I wish Joanne were here tonight, but she's not. So, without further ado, uh, I learned a long time ago that if I want to get through uh, a certain amount of time, of uh, material in a certain amount of time, I read it. I've been reading lectures for a long time. I do a pretty good job of it. Uh, I don't think I'll put you to sleep, but if I do, keep it to yourself. <laughs> All right. I call this 2016, Lou Wallace, Ben-Hur, and the Bicentennial of Indiana Independence. Larry, I, and my colleagues who work on Lou Wallace and Ben-Hur have been astounded by the recent flurry of interest in the general and his novel almost all of which has appeared in or around the bicentennial of Indiana statehood. It appears to have been coordinated, but I can assure you that for the most part it is not. In fact, the most interesting thing about it is that it hasn't been coordinated. I want to very briefly tell you about my response to each of the recent efforts to reimagine the General's Tale of the Christ, then see what conclusions I can draw from those responses, and I promise to leave time for discussion. I saw the new film in a sold-out theater on its premiere weekend, which meant that I saw it from the end of the second row. <laughs> I didn't wear my hearing aids because I thought it would be too loud. Now, my audiologist had told me that the aids would actually moderate loud sounds, but I thought I knew better wrong. It was so loud and so violent, not to mention dark and brooding. And although I'm very familiar with the novel and its many adaptations, I could not always figure out what was going on. 
I have become very dependent upon subtitles, I'm afraid. And I will admit that I was simply clueless at times about what was happening and why it was happening. And I can tell you, my friends, that that was the least of all possible expert things I expected going to see a production of Inner. <laughs> what just happened? <laughs> so I decided that in all fairness, I had to see it again, especially since I was scheduled to talk to you nice folks about it soon. I waited for 10 days to let the crowd thin out, which they, did, <laughs> which they did very quickly, especially after the first reviews. Then I returned wearing my hearing aids. This time I saw it in 3D. Have you seen it in 3D, anybody? No. Interesting. Oh, I couldn't imagine the chaotic sea battle and the chariot race with its flying horses and chariot in three dimensions. Watch out. When I walked into the theater, second time, I discovered that it was empty. I had a private screening. <laughs> I'm serious. By the way, I came back the very next day and saw it for the third time. Again, alone. The rumors are true. I hiked up to the very back row both times and braced myself for what turned out to be a very different viewing experience from the first time. First of all, the hearing aids worked. <laughs> I could even understand some of Jack Houston's raspy, choking mumblings. And the 3D didn't bother me at all. And despite the fact that the 3D glasses are slightly tinted, the film did not seem quite as dark and brooding as it did on the first viewing. That may be because I could actually see the entire screen now, uh, which would necessarily provide more light in all of the scenes. But my final impression of the film is that although it is not as bad as my first impression, or as terrible as almost all critics have said, it's still a bit of a mess. <laughs> and those of us who wished it well should not pretend otherwise. We do the general disservice if we pretend otherwise. So what went wrong? I think that the people who made it did not trust the general and his, <laughs> in his sturdy and oft-tested tale of the Christ and instead made all sorts of changes in it. <coughs> Truth to tell, I suspect that most of them have literally never read Ben-Hur. This is despite their claim that the film is not a remake of the 1959 film, but a reimagining re of the original novel. But to reimagine something requires, at minimum, a thorough knowledge of the original. I don't believe that the screenwriters and producers of this film possess that knowledge. I suspect, however, that they do, in fact, have a model for their reimagining. For several years now, conservative evangelical Christians have been making Wallace's novel their own and giving it a particularly evangelical Christian interpretation and emphasis. The change began with a radio drama sponsored by James Dobson's Focus on the Family about 2004 and continued with an animated version of Ben-Hur produced by Fraser Heston and starring his father as the narrator in God Help Us, the voice of Judah. <laughs> then in 2010, David Weiler, the son of William Weiler, who directed the 1959 film, put together a two-part TV miniseries that I believe was the immediate inspiration for the new film. Anybody saw that 2010 thing? Okay, that's okay. The, the, the DVDs and everything are all up here. This is my kind of show and tell. These Christian adaptations of Ben-Hur create for the Hur family a new backstory in which the orphaned or neglected Roman boy Masala lives with and becomes a beloved part of the Hur family. Judah and Masala become almost literally brothers. I think it says down there, brothers on the poster. It says brothers. Wallace's tale then becomes a story of the rehabilitation of Masala, who is now forgiven by a converted Judah and the story ends with the final reunion of the Hur family. This reimagined evangelical version of Ben Hur reaches its culmination in the 2016 movie, which, as you probably know, was produced by Christian media entrepreneurs Roma Downey and her husband Mark Burnett. So, how does this latest Christian adaptation rehabilitate Masala, who, as you know, in the novel is totally evil? It first demonstrates that the young Roman is religious, even if he worships different gods. Also, also Tirza, the sister, obviously loves Masala and vice versa. How bad could he be then? 
<laughs> we also discover that Masala has kept at his side throughout his military career the little horse and chariot toy that his brother Judah gave him as a boy. <laughs> In addition, the film introduces a new Roman character who is much more evil than Masala, his immediate superior Marcus Decimus, who is always on hand to remind Masala of his traitorous and cowardly grandfather in order to force Masala to pronounce very severe and cruel judgments that he almost certainly would not have made on his own. Then the film demonstrates that not all the bad guys are Romans. That, I think, is why the Jewish zealots figure so prominently in this film. Did you wonder, where did they come from? They were all over the place. Finally, the new film even makes the Hur family and then Judah himself complicit in the zealots' conspiracy against Rome. The new film even goes beyond earlier Christian adaptations in reconstructing the Hur family. It could be argued that in Sheik Ilderim, the family acquires something like a male head to replace in some ways Judah's dead father, Ithamar. Its reimagining the role of the Arab Sheik is the most significant change that the new film makes in Wallace's basic storyline. Played by the only well-known actor in the cast, Morgan Freeman, and the dread, the worst dreads ever, <laughs> Ilderim replaces several of the general's main char male characters, the Magi Balthasar and the faithful Moloch, who are entirely absent from the film, as well as Simonides and Quintus Arius, both of whom have practically who have dramatically altered and reduced work. <coughs> Let's do it. It is Ilderim who becomes Judah's mentor teaches him to handle a chariot in four, and then bribes the Romans into letting the, Jew, the young Jew compete in the chariot race and to be, forgive all charges against him if he defeats Masala. The Arab also takes charge of the healed lepers and returns them to their family. And it is Ilderim who, in the dramatic last scene of the film, leads the now reunited family, which now includes Masala, out of Jerusalem and into a new life. <laughs> wow. <laughs> All of this makes a war heartwarming story, but it is not the tale that Lou Wallace told. And I suspect that all of the changes that the new film made in the cast of characters and basic storyline of Ben-Hur turned out to be simply confusing and somehow did not register as expected with the film's targeted general audience, which does not always speak the language of the evangelical Christian niche market. And let's face it, it's not a particularly well-made movie. <laughs> the 1959 epic won 11 Oscars, including the ones for Best Picture, Acting, Directing, Editing, Cinematography, Set Design, Costumes, Music. <laughs> I don't think that this film will be winning any Oscars this year. <laughs> Let me give you one example of this difference. Now, you've seen the 59 film. Do you remember the scene in the cave where the women are healed? And Jesus is on the cross and all that light. Then here we go. One of the biggest problems I had with the new film was trying to figure out how did the lepers get healed? <laughs> <laughs> it's a miracle, but give me a break. <laughs> <laughs> they never come into contact with Jesus in any way unless I miss something which is entirely possible. <laughs> they know nothing of him or he of them. But somehow, while they are still in their prison cell, they are cured as they drink of the rainwater that seeps through the ceiling of their cell as Jesus dies. Are they healed by drinking miraculous tears of God? Are they healed because Judah has now converted to Christianity? It is not clear. But, in the 1959 film, we are not left to wonder how and why the lepers are healed. In that film, we see the lepers on Good Friday on the Via Dolorosa, where they forget their own pain and need and instead call out for mercy for the suffering Jesus as he struggles by them with his cross. You may remember that they drop their veil. Tears that drops her veil as Jesus walks by. Help him. Have mercy. And as Jesus, later we see them with, Des with Esther in a cave near Golgotha. And as Jesus dies on the cross, the film editor cuts repeatedly between Jesus' ghastly white body and the faces of the lepers in the cave, which are illuminated by brilliant flashes of lightning, we see them as they are healed. They then walk out of the cave and lift their healed faces to the cleansing, purifying rain, 
which flows then to the foot of the cross, where it mixes with, mixes with the blood of the Savior. And all of this is accompanied by the rising swells of the majestic Christ theme of Biclos Rosa's stupendous, magnificent score. This is serious movie, uh, movie making by serious professionals in a powerful studio at the top of its game. But alas, there is nothing like that in this scene, in the new film. Listen, if you are going to remake a classic movie, be sure you know what you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> After studying so many adaptations of Ben-Hur that make so many changes in his characters and plot, it was a great relief to turn to Carol Wallace's retelling of her great-great-grandfather's novel. Here I thought, would be one of adaptation that would have to stick to the general's tale, as he told it. And for the most part, that is exactly what she has done, and done very well, I might add. How many of you heard Miss Wallace when she was here? Okay. I really wish I could have done that. Miss Wallace's retelling of Ben-Hur was, of course, meant to coincide with the release of the new film, and hers has not been, but hers has not been the only recent commemorative publication of Ben-Hur. Last year, Harper Collins, the heir to the, the Harper Brothers that published The General's Tale of the Christ in 1880, reissued the novel, not because of the upcoming new movie, but as part of a series what they, uh, for the company, what the company called, for a series made up of what the company called underappreciated classics of American literature. Underappreciated? <laughs> I thought that was a little strange way of talking about the best-selling novel of the 19th century. <laughs> The book is noteworthy, I think, for this very fine introduction written by one John Stansberg, an editor for Slate, who a few years ago became fascinated by Wallace and the novel. This is a fascinating young man, by the way. He has also published on Slate a longer essay on the general's military and literary careers entitled The Passion of Lou Wallace, which I hardly recommend to one and all. John Stansberg, The Passion of Lou Wallace. It was revealing to have been her retold by a woman. I have no idea if the things that struck me as different in Miss Wallace's retelling of her ancestor's novel have anything to do with the fact that she is a woman. I will leave that for others to decide, but I did notice several things almost immediately as I began to make my way through this latest take on Ben Hur. First of all, I found myself inside the heads of the, general the general's characters much more often than I did in the original novel. Lou Wallace doesn't go into characters' heads. This was especially true of Wallace's female character. Miss Wallace gives to Judah's sister Tirza, to Esther, beloved daughter of Simonides, and to the slave Amra, an interior life that none of these women have in the original novel. And for Amra and Tirza, she creates important scenes that are not in the original novel. In one of the more arresting changes that she makes in the original plot narrative, Miss Wallace plunges the imprisoned women of her into total darkness in the prison. Total darkness for eight years. The five years. The general makes much of the fact, the general makes much of the fact that there is in the cell a little window high in an exterior wall of their cell through which a friendly ray of light shines daily. And Lou goes into great detail about the way in which the mother of Judah organizes their days and lives around that shift of light's movement. In Miss Wallace's retelling of the story, which is entirely told, told entirely from Tirza's perspective, there is only total darkness. And the author spends a great deal of time discussing the ways in which Tirza learns to confront her own terror and then the challenges of their situation. Miss Wallace's Tirza plays a much more central role than she does in the original or any of its adaptations in this, in this retelling. While the two leprous women live in total darkness, Amra lives in the shadows, in the confiscated and boarded earth her mansion. The general devotes perhaps a paragraph to the tiny Egyptian, the, the tiny Egyptian's life in the ruins, but his descendant takes an entire chapter to describe the ways in which the faithful slave lives in the house 
even if she does nothing to care for it, that would signal to the occasional Roman inspector that someone is actually living in the old building. Like her portrait of Tirza in darkness, Wallace's description of Amra's life in the shadow adds texture and complexity to her female characters, thereby further humanizing Tirza and Amra. At the same time, Miss Wallace describes an Esther who is much more competent, self-assured, even assertive than the rather shy and retiring creature we find in the original novel. There, Simonides, is very, her father, is very protective of Esther at the chariot race, which he insists is much too violent for her to view. But in this retelling, Simonides is eager, to, is eager to explain the finer points of the racing strategy, and his daughter is an enthusiastic student. She is every bit as involved in responding to the race as the more assertive Eris. Much of the new novel is told from Esther's perspective, and the author goes out of her way to demonstrate Esther's competence and to give her agency. Ms. Wallace seems determined to even the playing field between Esther, the daughter of Simonides, and Eris, the daughter of Balthazar. And one of the ways she does that is to stay out of the Egyptians' interior landscape. Eris is, in fact, the only main female character whose thoughts and emotions remain inaccessible to the reader. Miss Wallace even delves into the thoughts and emotions of several male characters. She regularly tells the reader what Judah is thinking and feeling. It is one of the ways in which she complicates and humanizes the novel's main character. She even allows us one brief, brief glimpse of what Miss Sala is feeling. When he condemns the women to prison in the immediate aftermath of the accident to Gratis, the Roman notices and remembers vividly the look of contempt that suffused the face of Judah's doomed mother as she left. Later, when he finds the woman's gold hairpin in the ruins of the house, he recalls that look with a pain of conscience and reproach. In several ways, Carol Wallace seems to be preparing the reader for the major changes in the general's novel that the reader will encounter in the new film. I have already mentioned the much more central role that Tirza plays in both the new film and in Miss Wallace's novel. But those familiar with the original novel, or even the 1959 film, will quickly notice that Balthazar, who is entirely absent in the movie, is also much less visible and significant in Miss Wallace's retelling of Ben-Hur. In the novel, the Egyptian Magi is one of the central characters. In some sense, Balthazar is the character who holds the novel together. It is Balthazar who connects the nativity material with which Ben-Hur begins to the main body of the novel. It is he who debates with Simonides throughout the novel the nature of Jesus' kingdom and his mission on earth. Those central debates, so important in the novel, all but disappear in Miss Wallace's retelling. And Balthazar is described by her as being old and feeble and is usually resting or sleeping. He's simply not there. To take his place, the new, mo the new movie makes Sheik Ildera the crucial driving force in the narrative. And in her retelling of the novel, Miss Wallace prepares the reader for that change. Ilderum does things in the new novel that were done by male characters in the original novel who are either absent or much reduced in importance in the new film. The sheik criticizes Eris' lack of modesty, not Simonides. It is Ilderum who develops a deep and powerful relationship with Judah, not Balthazar and Quintus Arius. And it is the sheik who replaces Arius as Judah's mentor and fabulously wealthy patron. Miss Wallace's Judah struck me as a much more thoughtful, troubled, and complex human being than the general's rather one-dimensional main character, sorry Lou, <laughs> who is determined to have his revenge at any cost. Now this gets a little complicated, so follow me. At several points, Miss Wallace's Judah is guilt-ridden for having remained in, in Rome for five years before he began to look for his family. Do you remember that? He stays in Rome for five years. Does, does he worry about it in the novel? Not at all. We don't know anything about, about uh, Judah in those five years. He's not there. They're absent. This is not true in the original Ben-Hur. Also, in the original novel, Judah tells Maluk that he intends to have every advantage possible in the race. 
Go check out his chariot. See where the vulnerabilities are. And the, the general clearly states that Judah carefully planned the maneuver that caused the Romans' crash and defeat. But the subsequent interpreters of the novel from the very beginning united in making the Roman the conniver and aggressor in the chariot race. Carol Wallace was the first to return to the general's original interpretation of Judah's role in, us, in ensuring that he, not Masala, would win the race at any cost. But, let the record show, Miss Wallace also makes the, new, the, the, the young Jew feel very torn <laughs> about his actions, which is to say, more human. If I had been here for Miss Wallace's talk, and I wish I had been, I would have asked her the question that I ask of every book I start to read, especially if I'm going to review the work. Question. Who was the intended audience of this novel, and how did the targeted audience affect the way in which you approached and wrote the book? Actually, the answer to that question is not clear to me after having read the book. But whatever the answer, I would like to urge everyone here tonight, especially here in Crawfordsville, the home of the general, to not let this very fine modern retelling of Ben-Hur satisfy you as a substitute for reading yourself the very long and very Victorian original version of Ben-Hur that makes your town so famous. If you haven't read the book, shame on you. <laughs> but as you struggle with this product of a past that is so very different from our modern age and equally inaccessible to we who live in it, simply marvel at the Victorian culture in which literally millions of Americans eagerly devoured the general's tale of the Christ and how utterly different from our own culture that Victorian world was. I had been visiting Crawfordsville and working on the general and Ben-Hur since the summer of 2000. The experience has been a richly rewarding one for me, largely because of the wonderful people whom I met at the study and in Crawfordsville, many of whom are in this room tonight. But another thing that has gratified me in those 15 years has been the rather sudden emergence of first a national and then an international group of scholars who are working on, on Wallace and Ben-Hur. That development owes much to recent scholarly trends in what has come to be called the history of the book and reading in which scholars investigate the ways in which readers respond to a work of literature and the role of the work then comes to play in society and culture. The scholars who are attracted to this approach tend to be students of literature and literary theory and various kinds of media. And these scholars study literature not as an end in not itself, but as a lens through which to view significant developments in culture and society. This approach has proven to be very especially attractive to students of American literature in the Victorian period that produced Ben-Hur. But that era also produced another best-selling novel, Harriet Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin. And it was to that novel that these students turned first, beginning at the turn of the 18th century. In 2013, David Reynolds, one of the leading students of the book and reading, published the first survey of Stowe's novel as a cultural artifact in American society from its publication in 1952 to the present. It's called Mightier Than the Sword, Uncle Tom's Cabin and the Battle for America. That flurry of interest in one of the, most, in one of the best selling Victorian American novels may have led to the recent upsurge of interest in Ben-Hur. In 2013, just as Reynolds published his new book, scholars interested in Ben-Hur held at Rutgers University a national symposium on the general's novel. Out of that symposium came the decision to publish a collection of essays on Ben-Hur in American culture. This is it. The co-editors have, co have become friends of mine and are both professors of American studies, but folks, guess where they teach? Millet Shamir teaches at Tel Aviv University, <laughs> and Barbara Ryan teaches at the National University of Singapore. <laughs> the book was published earlier this year by Syracuse Univers University Press in its very distinguished media studies series. It is called Bigger Than Ben-Hur, the book, its adaptations, and their audiences. The subtitle is a concise statement of the issues that interest these scholars. The book itself and its reception, the various ways in which it has been adapted into different media over time, 
the makeup of the adapt adaptation's audiences and the response to it, and finally, what it all means about American culture. Ryan and Shamir collaborated on the preface of the essay, which concludes a, which includes a rather challenging, in, uh, incomprehensible to me, <laughs> uh, mm -hmm, introduction to theoretical studies. Then there are, I'm not lying, <laughs> I'm not kidding. <laughs> I don't speak theory, it turns out. <laughs> then there are separate essays on a host of topics that give you some sense of the range of the various authors to scholar their interests. They focus on, among other things, Ben-Hur and the American response to Rome as a cultural model or cautionary tale. <laughs> then there are essays on the novel and motherhood, Christmas, race, the Sunday school movement, Zionism and Judaism, the script for the 1925 film, homosexuality in the 1959 epoch, and one scholar's wish list for what a new film adaptation of Ben-Hur might focus on. The new film doesn't focus on it. <laughs> <laughs> I contributed an essay on the way in which the stage version of Ben-Hur helped overcome Christian opposition to attending the theater, just as the novel itself have led many Christians who are opposed to reading novels to make an exception in the case of the general's tale of the Christ and then got hooked on reading novels. <laughs> Let me tell you a little bit about the <coughs> final essay in the collection. It is, it is by a classicist at the University of Illinois, just right over yonder, named John Solomon. It, and now we will wait for the, the train to pass. <laughs> I remember the first time I heard that, and I asked Joanne, where is that train coming? <laughs> she said, why? <laughs> It is entitled, A Timeline of Ben-Hur Companies, Brands, and Products. Solomon is the author of a 1976 Yale publication entitled, The Ancient World in the Cinema, which remains a definitive study of his subject. For about 10 years now, John Solomon has been working on Ben-Hur, and from the beginnings, he has been interested primarily in the business and economic dimensions of the novel and its many adaptations. John is a computer whiz, to say the very least, and I think he must live on the internet. <laughs> it was on the web, especially on sites like eBay, that John discovered what was, in effect, a material, lost material culture of the Ben-Hur phenomenon. More so than any other novel, Ben-Hur spawned a virtual universe of the company's brands and products of the essay's title. I am sure that all of you by now have seen the Ben-Hur spices that you can always find at Cabbages and Kings downtown. Well, believe me, that tin of Ben-Hur allspice is not even the tip of the iceberg. <laughs> Solomon's essay in the Syracuse collection gives you some idea of just how enormous the iceberg is. He himself has accumulated over in Urbana-Champaign a personal collection of more than 600 little things, Ben-Hur memorabilia and commercial items that were produced in the late 19th and early 20th centuries in order to cash in on the name of the era's best-selling novel and the chariot race that was its centerpiece. Products with the Ben-Hur name ranged in size from tiny little pens to automobiles and even steamships. <laughs> the commercial enterprises carrying the name of Ben-Hur went from flour mills to gold mines. And little Ben-Hur towns popped up everywhere. <laughs> and they're all listed in this very unusual concluding essay. Well, earlier this year, shortly after this book was published, John Solomon finally published the results of his decade plus of industrious and meticulous, not to say obsessive, research into which I have called, into what I have called in print, the Ben-Hur tradition and what John calls the Ben-Hur phenomenon. <clears throat> The book is entitled Ben-Hur, the original blockbuster, and in some ways it is as monumental as the general's novel and its cultural progeny. It is almost a thousand pages long <laughs> and has several chapters, chapters that are more than 100 pages in length, each. It's amazing. 
the almost 600 footnotes to the enormous chapter on the material culture alone that I just mentioned takes up 18 pages of the text. <laughs> wow, indeed. That's what I said, but I'm wrong. <laughs> it is impossible, of course, for me to even begin to tell you in a few minutes what Solomon says about the Ben-Hur phenomenon in more than 850 pages. Suffice it to say that he covers the entire chronological sweep of the novel's history, from the life of the author before 1880 up to the announcement in 2014 of plans for a new movie. It's all there, the novel, the adaptations that preceded the stage version of, of, of 1899, like the Tableau Vivant and Stereopticon shows, the Claw and Erlinger play, the colossal Seidel, Seidel, <laughs> silent film of 1925, the adaptations between 1925 and 59, which include wonderful comic book versions of Ben Hur, they're so cute. <laughs> the 1959 film itself, and of course the adaptations of the more recent past, which include huge arena shows of Ben Hur uh, in Europe and Australia, as well as the several evangelical Christian ventures that I have already mentioned. It's exhaustive and exhausted. The book itself weighs five pounds. <laughs> Solomon's organizing focus is on Ben-Hur and the process of synergy. And I quote, Ben-Hur was the prototype for the business synergies that today form the quintessential relationship between marketable artistic properties and consumer culture. He is interested primarily in the ways in which that synergistic relationship between a uniquely profitable literary property, Ben-Hur, mm -hmm. and changes in consumer culture developed and changed over time from 1880 to the present. It is an enormous achievement, and it will take the community of Wallace Ben-Hur scholars some time to digest and <coughs> respond to it. I myself am still in a little bit of shell shock. <laughs> but I do have this one general reaction. John clearly intends to demonstrate that Lou, Wallace no Lou Wallace's novel uniquely produced an enormously profitable tradition of sequential, highly successful commercial ventures. That synergy, as he calls it, is now beyond debate. But synergy, as I understand it, I had to look it up, is the interaction between two or more agents, forces, organizations, or other kinds of variables that produces interaction that produces an effect greater than the sum of its parts. John has done a superb job of fleshing out an incredible number of parts. It seems to me that he has been less successful in rising above those parts in order to relate his process of synergy to larger developments in American culture. John finished his research and then published his book just before the release of the 2016 film. In light of his argument about the unique synergy among Wallace's novel, its cultural progeny, and American consumer culture, how are we to understand the fact that this adaptation, for the first time in the tradition, was a financial flop? Now, I was going to say failure, but let's just say flop. <laughs> Estimates are now that it will lose upwards of $120 million. Now, in movie terms, that's not really all that much money. But it's been her. Yeah. Here's a possible explanation. You won't be surprised to know that I have a possible explanation. <laughs> I have argued in print that the source of Ben-Hur's abiding success in American popular culture has been the unique way in which it has combined religion and spectacle. The 1959 epic demonstrated just how well that could be done by combining a carefully conceived and executed tale of the Christ with perhaps the most spectacular action set piece in cinematic history, the great chariot race of Ben-Hur. The people who made the 2016 film, no matter how much CGI magic they produced, could not hope to compete with the 1959 race or with the progeny of Star Wars. <laughs> <laughs> and, that takes care of the spectacle part, they muddled the tale of the Christ by introducing a very strange talking Jesus who keeps popping up constantly and saying, there's a better one. 
and by releasing a trailer that inexplicably, inexplicably underplayed the religious dimensions of the film. It was all about violence, the chariot race, and the, the, the sea chase, the sea battle, despite the fact that the movie was obviously aimed at a Christian audience. And alas, the evangelicals apparently didn't get the message that this was their movie and didn't show up. <laughs> now, something ironic is going on here. As I've suggested, the recent ad adapters of Ben-Hur seem to be losing confidence in the characters and basic narrative of the general's novel. And their latest endeavor, the 2016 film, was a financial flop. But at the same time, the academic world, that would be my world, is finally, some of your worlds, is finally discovering the usefulness of his literary creation as a lens through which to investigate significant developments in American culture and society. Mind you, no scholar is suggesting that Lou wrote the great American novel. <laughs> the literary fame and acceptance that the general sought throughout his life continued to elude him. But several scholars are suggesting that what Lou created is enormously important, not for its literary merits, but for its unique staying power in American popular culture. And the financial failure of the latest cinematic adaptation notwithstanding, Ben-Hur's final staying power is not going to diminish. What the failure of the 2016 film showed us is that the day of the spectacular chariot race is simply over. If you want to see a great race, rent the DVD of the 1925 or 59 film, end of story. But Lou's tale of the Christ abides and is not going anywhere. The Christian market that made Ben-Hur a bestseller in the first place has rediscovered it, big time. And, and this is even more important, Lou Wallace's literary property is now entirely in the public domain. Mm -hmm. Write it down. Mm -hmm. Nobody has to worry about literary copyright. Nobody has to worry about cinematic copyright. And everyone has access to the internet and thinks that they can make anything that they want. And <laughs> they're doing it. In the age of the internet and individual media entrepreneurship, Ben-Hur is loose and available. And the results can be fascinating and unpredictable. And I would like to conclude by telling you about two of them. Neither of them particularly Christian. This is the first of them. In 2011, a Canadian high school English teacher, English and Latin teacher, named Louis Scouter, wrote a book, published a sequel to Ben-Hur, entitled Masala, The Return from Ruin. You thought Masala was dead, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> Silly thing, you read the book. <laughs> Here, the rehabilitation of Masala, I've been talking about, is complete. The novel is told from the Roman's perspective and in his voice. Turns out he survived Eris' attempt to murder him. Missed me but that much. And he now lives next door. <laughs> he now lives next door to Mr. And Mrs. Her in Mycena. In Eris's, I don't make this up. <laughs> I couldn't make it up. <laughs> and in this telling, Masala is the wrong party. And Judah turns out to be something of a snob and a jerk. Who knew? Actually, it's great fun and worth the read. <laughs> you have to stock it. You sell some of these books. <laughs> oh, I'm done with that. <laughs> and finally, there is this wonderful thing. In October of 2010, the Theatre Royal Bath, England, and the People of Bath, put on a community production of Ben-Hur as a community production. They used no professionals and cast the play entirely from the people of Bath who also did all the work in creating and producing the play. It was a true community project and I think that the journal would have loved it. <laughs> it's exactly the kind of community effort that led 
to the first post-novel adaptations of Ben-Hur in the cities of Indiana in the 1880s in the form of tableau vivant productions. The general, bless his heart, even assisted, I think he had a great time, even assisted with the scenery and costumes for the Crawfordsville productions. Actually went up to Lafayette, I think, too, and to somewhere else, Terre Haute, I think. And then formed his own company that toured for several years in the 80s and 90s. So it seems appropriate to conclude my lecture with this British communal endeavor, which reminded me so very much of early Indiana productions of Ben Hur from the golden age of Hoosier literature. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.